Thank you, David. Yes, so my name is Halela Desnick. I'm faculty here at UC Berkeley, and it's a great, an honor to be able to speak at this conference. Um, originally, I was just going to tell you just about one project, but because I've seen how the talks have gone, I wanted to give you actually half a 15 minute discussion of actually neural computation in the visual cortex, following up on Ken and a little bit on what Massimo has talked about. But I'm going to talk about a different computation you heard a lot about from Ken, which is contextual modulation. And the specific instance is surround suppression in the visual cortex. So I'm not going to take the time to introduce it because Ken went through that pretty extensively. But I want to show a figure from sort of a now classic paper uh, from David Furster and Ken, um, and where they were making whole cell recordings uh, from the cat, an anesthetized cat. And if you give a small stimulus to the CRF, the, the classical receptive field, you see beautiful spiking. If you, as Ken pointed out, if you increase the size of the stimulus, you see a massive suppression of the firing, a normalization of the firing rates. And an interesting feature is that if you rotate the surround so the, the features of the center surround are different, like an orientation, you notice that you actually don't get much suppression. You can even get facilitation. Um, I'll describe why we might think this is important in a second, but I just want to point out that this is a phenomenon that's widely observed across many species. And when I was in Mossel's lab, we found it in mouse. Uh, you don't see it under anesthesia, so it probably hadn't been studied prior. But in awake mouse, it's actually even more potent, I think, than you see in cats. So what is it good for? This is pure conceptual. Um, one idea is figure ground segregation. So you, you're uh, only suppressing neurons that are sort of encoding redundant or, or dependent features. Like, um, so it helps you identify boundaries or separate the figure from the ground, like a grating floating in front of another grating with a different orientation, saliency, and so forth. And the idea is that it's going to sparse in the code by suppressing a lot of spikes that aren't necessary for encoding uh, redundant information. And so making your code more efficient. But I'm going to focus really on the mechanisms, because uh, that's what, you know, coming from Mossman's lab, we think we're good at. Um, and so is it subcortical? Um, a lot of the features of surround suppression don't suggest this, like it's orientation dependence. It's the fact that it's delayed in time. Um, so if it's cortical, is it through increased inhibition? And the initial hypothesis was yes. Maybe it's the simplest model would be that you simply increase some activity of inhibitory neuron, increase GABA onto the pyramidal cells and therefore divide their firing rates. Um, but an alternative hypothesis, uh, also equally perhaps as simple, is that you simply remove excitation. You withdraw excitation from the cells. Or, not to the exclusion of either of those, it's actually a change in the ratio of excitation and inhibition. So which one of these? So uh, I'm not going to go through all of this paper from Ozeki et al., which is a David Furster and Ken Miller's paper. And this is the description of the inhibition stabilized network. Uh, but the key idea there was that uh, as you add the surround over the center, you get a transit increase in the I cell, the inhibitory cell activity. But that actually drives the entire network down into a suppressed state. So the net effect is a withdrawal of excitation and inhibition, which is something that you see here. Uh, so less excitation, less inhibition when the stimulus is large than when it is small. So when I was in Massimo's lab, we had uh, been looking at cortical interneurons. Uh, in the awake mouse, we had observed surround suppression. We had noticed this one class of interneuron called the somatostatin interneuron that was different than all other types of cells that we had observed in layer 2, 3. That's firing rate increased monotonically with the size of a grating. So it itself showed basically almost no surround suppression. So this is consistent with a model where this neuron is driven by larger and larger gratings and would therefore suppress the pyramidal cells to drive surround suppression. Indeed, if you optogenetically suppress these cells, you can relieve a lot of surround suppression. So this link, the activity of this one particular relatively rare subtype of inhibitory cell in surround suppression. So how does this jive with the model of the, the ISN and the predictions of the ISN and the data of Ozeki et al? So I don't think they're directly, um, they, they could be compatible. It was assumed they weren't for a while. Um, so I'd like to, s what we want to do is to address these questions in the context of, of Ozeki's experiments. Okay. So what I did was, is I made whole cell recordings from awake behaving mice. Uh, so the experiment we had done previously was extracellular recordings. Um, but we had to ask, what are the intracellular conductances, the excitation, the inhibition? You see that in red is excitation, EPSCs, or inhibition, IPSCs. Here's just two 
represent, representative examples of layer two through pyramidal cells that you can measure in a mouse as you increase the size of the stimulus. And what you can see in these cells is that excitation increases a little bit. And so you get to the sort of the, the uh, CRF, the receptive field diameter, but then you see definitely prominent suppression or withdrawal of excitation. And in addition, you see something qualitatively somewhat different, but not that different. You don't see this massive uh, increase in inhibition that monotonically increases with size. It kind of runs up and then it sort of flattens out or even in many cells shows suppression. So broadly speaking, this is actually pretty consistent with the work of Ozeki et al. That actually, as you increase the size of a stimulus and cells fire less, you see a withdrawal of total synaptic input. But one thing I wanted to point out that was pretty critical that maybe wasn't highlighted in the paper of David Furster is that if you compare the ratio of excitation to inhibition, you see that systematically across many, many cells, you see a decrease in the ratio. Such that while excitation is absolutely being withdrawn, it, inhibition is not being suppressed or withdrawn as much. So there's a net reduction in the EI ratio. And in fact, as Ken pointed out before the break, this is a plot from that same uh, paper from Ken, is that indeed you can, there's a prediction from the stabilized superlinear <coughs> network that E and I, that the ratio should drop. And indeed that's what we confirmed. And as a side point, the same relationship holds in cats, it holds in mice that I showed here between the spike rate and the memory potential. So the network of V1 in mouse looks to act very much like a stabilized superlinear network, at least from this perspective. So this really seemed to add further support that mice and cats are, or a mouse is a little cat, is a little monkey. And in fact, everything you saw in cats, you could see in mice, but we now have the ability to actually ask, how do somatostatin cells do that, which you can't right now do this in cats or monkeys. And so you, in the somatostatin cells, you express the optogenetic silencer halorhodopsin. And you simply ask what happens when you suppress the somatostatin cells on the excitation and on the inhibition. So black is controlled and with light with this little bar is an orange. And what you can see here is if you look at the black, this is the size tuning of excitation. You can see it's size tuned. And the inhibition, so slightly less size tuned, but certainly not consistent with just a run up of inhibition. But the key idea here is that if you suppress the somatostatin cells, you don't see a reduction you actually see a massive increase in excitation and inhibition. And in fact, that's a little bit counterintuitive. Why would you see an increase in inhibition for suppressing inhibitory neurons? In fact, that's a prediction of inhibition stabilized network, a paradoxical effect. And so what somatostatin cells are clearly doing is they're suppressing the network. They're driving surround suppression, not by adding net GABAergic inhibition that you would see at the soma of these cells, but by actually suppressing the network and driving a withdrawal of both excitation and inhibition. And so therefore, I think there's a synthesis of this data between cats and mice that these cells are critical to driving the surround suppression by suppressing the network in the inhibition stabilized network. But I wanted to point out one other interesting thing as a slight tangent. Sorry, sorry, did, yeah. did you actually record from uh, um, somatostatin cells, at least extracellularly, why you were perturbing their activity? So they were suppressed, yeah. They were suppressed in various. Yeah, about 60%. Oh, yeah. Um, can I, can I ask another question? So what you're saying is that um, the somatostatin population is a small minority of the other inhibitory interneurons that are sort of intermingled with each other. And mm -hmm. what is known about the connect, like, uh, right. anatomical okay. connectivity? Okay. Fair. Good point. So, um, okay. So why is there more inhibition, maybe? For example, yeah. yeah. So there's two reasons. Two reasons. Yes, somatostatin cells, as Massimo and other people have shown, directly inhibit parvalbumin cells. Yeah. And certainly a lot of this inhibition you're measuring is from parvalbumin cells of the synapse near the soma. Uh -huh. Um, but the explanation for why you see a greater inhibition is really twofold. One is you relieve surround suppression, pyramidal cells fire more, yeah. and then drive the PV cells more. So it's the inverse of what surround sure. suppression is doing in the ISN. You could also interpret it, and I don't think that's exclusive, as removal of inhibition from the PV cells directly. So it's a combination probably of the two, although the ISN doesn't require that. Um, so I wanted to point out something slightly different, which is... Um, about neural synchronization in the exact same scenario, the exact same increasing size. And I don't know why might this might be interesting is you're getting suppression. You're really removing a lot of spikes for these large gratings. You're normalizing the firing rates. You're presumably making the code more efficient. Um, and yet there's something you do want to integrate over contours. You want neurons to be able to summate over contours and recognize boundaries. And so perhaps there's coding not just in the rate domain, but in the temporal domain such that synchronization between neurons that are representing, say, long contours across their receptive fields might synchronize in a better way to drive neurons downstream. And this is an idea proposed decades ago that neurons will synchronize uh, under certain conditions where they're uh, basically processing input that would extend across their receptive fields. 
when it has the common features like common orientation. And so if you actually look carefully, and I only noticed this like a couple weeks ago, and I pointed this to Ken literally yesterday. He didn't notice it, I think. If you look at this recording from Ozeki, you see that if you look at, so here's, there's no surround suppression, no surround suppression, powerful surround suppression. If you look at the subthreshold VM, you see a massive oscillation of the memory potential, which they didn't, I don't think they made a point of at all in that paper. Uh, so that's just highlight. You can see it, it's in about 25 to 35 Hertz. And so incidentally, this is, this is interesting because I didn't notice this in this paper, but if you look in mice and you're putting an extracellular electrode in the cortex of mice and you increase the stimulus size to drive surround suppression, you notice that as surround suppression is going, getting stronger, so parameter cells are firing less and less, the, the population is getting very sparse, there's a massive increase in neural synchronization. This is very evident in the local field potential, but it's also evident in the cross-correlation of neurons spiking. And so the synchronization plotted here increases monotonically with size, even as the firing rates decrease monotonically with size. That's also pretty interesting, because if you look at this as the large grade and giving you a large synchronization, if you do a cross-oriented grading with tries, basically no surround suppression or less, this is on a log scale, you see a massive uh, difference, a reduction in the synchronization. So when the, t this is, and I'll show this a little bit later, but basically you get much less synchronization between regions of the cortex that are representing cross-oriented features. So they don't synchronize if they're representing cross-oriented features. Now what underlies the synchronization? So the hypothesis is inhibition. And so if you actually measure inhibition, as I just showed you in a few slides ago, same, same ex exact experiment, you're increasing the size of the stimulus, but now we're actually measuring synchronization in the power spectrum of this inhibitory current. You see that as stimulus gets larger and larger, you see a massive increase in synchronization. You can see this in these rhythmic inhibitory currents, which come at the exact same frequency as the local field potential and the spiking of neurons. So this gave us the hypothesis that since surround suppression, depends on somatostatin cells, and they fire more and more with increased size. They're the only cell to do that in layer two, three, to our knowledge. Everybody else is suppressed by larger sizes, that they're actually mediating this effectively, if you want to call it, gamma band synchronization. And so you put uh, your halorhodopsin and your somatostatin cells, and you ask if this synchronization can be destroyed by silent somatostatin cells, and indeed it can. And so you have this rhythmic synchronization close to 30 hertz that's really strongly suppressed when you take out some metastatin cells. So they seem to be doing two things. They're, they're normalizing the population to drive sparse coding for um, surround suppression, but at the same time, the spikes that are left behind are extremely synchronous. So maybe they're basically, you can think of they're removing the non-synchronous spikes. Oh, that's just one way to think of it. The, the idea is they're powerfully synchronizing the cortex, particularly across distant regions of the cortex. So here, if you, uh, this is Julia Vitt's work in the lab, if you stick two multi-electrode arrays about 20, 30 degrees of visual space uh, separated in V1, so looking down on V1, you have these two electrodes, you can measure the synchronization of neurons and LFPs between these two electrodes, and you see for a large cross-oriented grading that covers the receptive fields of these two electrodes, massive uh, synchronization between those two electrodes, and this is measured in this coherence plot, so very, very high coherence. But if you suppress somatostatin cells, that coherence becomes substantially reduced. So somatostatin cells are mediating this long-range synchronization one sees specifically for these iso-oriented gratings, but not for the cross-oriented gratings. So just to conclude this first part, the idea is that surround suppression is sort of canonical computation that we see in the visual system and in many other systems. Um, is mediated by a withdrawal of excitation and inhibition and a reduced EI ratio. And that's maybe the key thing. I think this was probably in Ozeki's data, but wasn't pointed out. Um, also shown by Jeff Isaacson in the auditory system very recently. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is, are the guys that are synchronized, do they tend to have the same orientation as each other? Or, because it's weird, if, if you have, how does, how does, who knows whether it's a cross-oriented grading or not? I mean, those guys have all orientations, so. Do the, do the large field gratings specifically synchronize only the opposite, you know, the orthogonally oriented cells? <coughs> or do they mm. synchronize everybody? Um, well, under this condition, there's, there's low firing rates. The spikes you get are from cells that prefer this orientation. So in this, in a mouse layer 2, 3, really the only thing you can observe firing among the pyramidal cells are cells that prefer these horizontal gratings. So yeah, the answer would be that if they're iso-oriented, then they synchronize. I'm not saying they couldn't synchronize cross-oriented, and maybe there is synchronization of cells that prefer different orientations, but yeah, definitely the, this is dominated by neurons in layer 2, 3 that are prefer, prefer their responses for this orientation. Yeah. Is there an explanation for that increased coherence at like low frequencies? Yeah, I am not 100% that is really reproducible. This is one example. 
talking about frequencies, so this is 20, 30 hertz. Yeah. Traditional gamma is like 40 and up. Yeah, I'm not so traditional. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an interesting point. Um, you know, you get three reviewers, they each have a different, you look, look at 20 gamma papers, they all assign different. Look, I, that's a little bit semantic. I can get into that. I want to talk about the other stuff, but basically... Slow gamma. Uh, yeah, you could call it slow gamma. <laughs> if you look in monkeys, if we consider that the important, they have this exact thing. It's at 40 hertz, but it has all the exact same features. It's size, tune, everything is the same. Mice are a little bit slower. That's all I can say. It might be the biophysics of the neurons or the synapses. Um, so I would, you know, you can call this gamma, that's what I would call it, but it, I, to me it doesn't matter. What somatostatin cells are doing is they're synchronizing populations of neurons across the retinotopic field. Okay, so yes, yeah, so surround suppression is mediated by actually withdrawal of excitation inhibition, that the SOM cells, that the way they drive suppression is by withdrawing ENI or by suppressing the entire network, and they synchronize the remaining spikes, which perhaps is a good mechanism for temporal coding of, say, extended contours. Of course, that's clearly a, a contentious hypothesis. But maybe with manipulations of some cells in the future, targeted manipulations, you might be able to ask whether this synchronization is even good for, say, sensory perception. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears for a little moment and talk about uh, what we realized that, uh, when I started the lab here a few years ago in Berkeley is that the one photon optogenetics we were doing was useful, it was genetically targeted, but it didn't have the precision in space and time that we really wanted to understand how ensemble activity in the cortex drives sensory perceptions. And so, you know, optogenetics is very powerful, and this is a drawing or a artist rendition of optogenetics from Ed Boyden's website, but of course this is completely fanciful. You can't shine a blue flashlight on one neuron in the brain. This is what optogenetics often looks like in many labs around the world. And so what optogeneticists are using is the advantage of the genetic targeting, not so much the spatial targeting. And we needed spatial targeting in the cortex in particular because you have you know, thousands of pyramidal cells that are not so differentiable genetically, and we wanted to write patterns of activity in the brain at cellular resolution millisecond precision. So what do we need? So exactly that. So if we're going to create patterns in the brain that would mimic physiological patterns and therefore allow us to causally relate these patterns to perception and ask key questions about neural coding, we need to be able to manipulate cells one at a time or ensembles, but with cellular resolution. Major question in the cortex is how much information is encoded in the timing of spikes. We don't know the answer completely, so we wanted to be able to have a tool that could get us to this. So it had to have millisecond precision, it didn't exist had to operate in three dimensions, which is non-trivial in some optical systems, and a need to control a large number of neurons and do it at very high speed. So basically you want to operate at the speed and scale of sensory percepts in the primary uh, sensory cortex. So we turned to a technology called two-photon uh, holography, or computer-generated holography, pioneered by a number of groups, including that of Valentina Emiliani. And uh, basically the idea here is you take your infrared two-photon laser beam, so it propagates through brain tissue very effectively, and this is the key part of the system, which is a spatial light modular. It's a device that takes this Gaussian wavefront of light and basically reshapes it through phase modulation into a three-dimensional pattern of light, and I'll show you that in the next slide. And so we came up with a tool that basically overcome a bunch of technical limitations that I won't bore you with, we call this 3D shot, or three-dimensional scanless holographic optogenetics with temporal focusing. But the key idea here is that you can generate with a single shot of a laser, a single femtosecond pulse can be reshaped into this three-dimensional pattern of light. Well, each of these blobs of light has been designed to be about the size of one pyramidal cell in layer two, three of a mouse cortex. And you can place as many, uh, up to hundreds of spots in a small volume at anywhere you want, basically, in the 3D. And so this allows you, at least optically, to pass light onto the neurons of interest that are defined by you or defined by the data you've collected in this animal. So this, this solves the optical problem. It gives you cellular resolution. I won't show you the data that verifies that. It's published. And it operates inherently in 3D because it's a holographic approach. But that was actually challenging for temporal focusing for the aficionados in the room. But it, it does this. But now the question is we really want a millisecond precision, which turned out to be an even bigger challenge. And we wanted to control large numbers of neurons at high speed, which also is a technical challenge. So first, to achieve millisecond precision, if you're interested in recreating patterns of activity in the brain with extremely high fidelity, um, it turns out that you're limited by the opsin protein, the microbial opsin. I'm sure many of you are familiar with chanaridopsin. Chanaridopsin, for a number of reasons, is not good. So what we needed was an opsin that was extremely fast on and off to give us this precision in time. It had to be very, very strong. You can only put so much light in the brain before the, either the brain heats up or the cell basically turns into a plasma. And you have to have the right spectral sensitivity, in particular because you want to be imaging GCAMP 
at the same time, which has a certain <coughs> spectral sensitivity, and you don't have crosstalk. Okay, so long story short, we tried like 20 opsins that none of them are good enough. And so we realized we had to actually engineer an opsin specifically designed for multi-photon holographic optogenetics. And so we lined up the sequences, this is the amino acid sequences of many different cation opsins that had existed, some natural, some synthetic. And we actually looked at the best opsin out there in terms of speed, which was called Kronos, really amazingly fast, designed by nature, also pretty potent. But there was something pretty amazing about Kronos that every other opsin except for Kronos, at this one particular residue, which lines the, the, the conductive pore of this channel, for every other opsin, like channel opsin was a glutamate, a charged residue, for this was a methionine, which made us think that's pretty interesting. Methionine, for those who don't know, is quite different from glutamate. It's not charged, it's much bulkier. And so we reasoned that if we manipulated this residue, turned it back to a glutamate, it might be a lot better. So we call this option chronos methionine to glutamate or chrome. And indeed, if you look at the photocurrents you can get, so this is voltage clamp photocurrents from a bunch of regular options people have used. And this is from the option, this is literally a point mutation in chronos. You get basically a fourfold increase. And that fourfold increase was really necessary. Because if you look at the current you need to spike a cell in the cortex, in particular layer two, three pyramidal cells are just not very excitable. They're hyperpolarized, they have low input resistance. These opsins don't get you to this threshold level, this dashed line that reliably spikes a cell, but chrome does that no problem. And so if you look at the fraction of cells you can spike under any condition, uh, which is just more light, you can spike basically 100, almost 100% 100 of chrome cells. So that's, we had to do that, so we use that moving forward. And we ask, given this option, which is still very fast, but also very potent, can we replay a pattern of activity that would look basically like a normal pattern of activity in the cortex? And for that, we generated a pattern of activity that was basically Poisson and statistics, such that they're coming randomly in time. This is a raster plot of the holographic pulses we deliver to the neuron. Then we put a loose patch electrode under two photon guidance on a cell expressed in the option, and we measure the spikes given each pulse of light. We overlay that, quantify that statistically, and the bottom line is, for this example, that about 96% of the time that you want one spike, you get exactly one spike, not zero and not two. And importantly, the jitter of that spike is less than a millisecond. It could be as little as 100 microseconds because you're getting these very large, fast photocurrents. So you can replay a pattern of activity with basically much more fidelity than the cortex would ever give you, right? Because these neurons are firing somewhat stochastically. Okay, so the very slight tangent. You also want to delete specific spikes for other purposes. So very briefly, we used an anion channel opsin, so an opsin that actually fluxes chloride. We had to engineer it in a number of ways so it wasn't toxic, and indeed, same exact microscope could suppress the spikes of the cell, both rapidly within a few milliseconds uh, and very potently. But I'm not going to talk much about that. Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss is how do you actually use this microscope for doing biology experiments? So we wanted a system that could both read and write simultaneously, do it in three dimensions, high speed, large scale. And so the way you do this is you build a microscope with both a two photon laser scanning microscope for G-CAMP imaging and a second arm that does the holographic multi-photon optogenetics. And so here, here's one cell. Oh man, you can't see that. But basically you can make sure you're firing each cell by simply measuring its calcium response to your pulses. And this is increasing the laser energy targeted to like one particular cell. You get a dose response curve and you pick the amount of light <coughs> that you want to target that cell just to make sure you don't want too much light, you don't want too little light, you want it to get spiking, you know, 90, 100% of the time. Okay, so this is a movie in which you're imaging two planes, a little bit like Mark Sheffield was probably showing you. Yeah, you're just tuning your microscope lens. Um, the, the optogenetics is done inherently in 3D. The imaging is done sort of semi-sequentially, but almost simultaneously in 3D. And so here's just two example planes at 250 and 200 microns below the peel surface. A green arrow comes up when you're gonna stimulate that cell with a hologram, and we're doing one cell at a time. This is playing in a loop, and you can see that the cell fires, that's red. Uh, and so you can play one cell at a time, and you can do it selectively in 3D. Um, you can quantify this with a calcium raster plot where red indicates firing. These are different trials, so the cell fires very reliably. And you do this for a sequence of such cells, and you can generate a very pre precise temporal sequence. To take it to the extreme, Alan Mardinley, who did all these experiments, um, decided, okay, let me try 134 neurons in a three-dimensional volume. And here's the data from that. Here's five individual trials, five repetitions. And you can see pretty reliably you can generate this temporal sequence of activity where you're firing one cell after the other. But this really wasn't what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do was to play ensembles of activity, since all codes are population-based. 
And so here you can target multiple cells at a time, same exact configuration as before, but you're hitting a groups of cells uh, at a time, and you can see that they're flashing. And so this shows you about five or 10 cells. We want to expand this. So currently, you're actually limited in how you measure spikes and how you deliver them. Calcium imaging has some constraints, but regardless, here's a movie of three planes where we're stimulating different numbers of cells. The arrows flash real briefly. And then we're doing up to 50 cells spread across this 100, 150 micron volume. So while we can't measure millisecond precision with calcium, I can tell you we're fairly confident these spikes are coming in with millisecond precision and so forth, and with basically quasi-cellular uh, resolution. So all the activity you're actually seeing, this is a quiescent mouse, you're seeing is actually driven by our holographic stimulation. This is just arbitrary pattern stimulation, but the question is, so how would you use this microscope? And so my lab is interested in neural coding for sensory perception, I think as most of us are. And so the idea is we actually train mice in the lab to discriminate different objects with their whiskers. We've mostly studied the barrel cortex. Um, mice are quite easy to train to discriminate objects. Um, I'll just you know, give you an example, like differentiating a sphere and a cube. So they can do this with their whiskers. And you can measure with calcium the patterns of activity that naturally occur when an animal is touching different objects. Yeah. And so once you can measure those patterns, and this is what neuroscientists have done for decades, they've correlated activity with stimuli. We then want to flip it on its head and ask if those patterns can causally drive the perception. And we can quantify this because the animal is basically doing the equivalent of two different levers, pressing lever A for stimulus A and lever B for stimulus B. So if we can fool the animal by putting in a specific spatial temporal pattern because it'll press lever B, even when the object is not actually presented to the object. So there have been a number of groups that have generated sort of perceptions, though not specific, they'll shine thousands of neurons with blue light, so one photon optogenetics, or even microstimulate one or a small number of neurons to generate a de novo percept. It's not a specific percept. It's not for a specific, it's probably just some sort of buzz in their brain. We want to generate a specific percept. And so we take those patterns and we would play them back into the brain. This is what we're literally doing right now. And ultimately, let's say that works. And there's reasons why it may or may not work. Let's say it does. Then the key question is, if I play a pattern that's physiological and I get the animal to perceive a cube, and then I begin to parametrically alter, alter that pattern, so which cells fire, how much each cells fire, the sequence that different cells fire, or the temporal synchronization of the activity, since we have basically arbitrary control of those parameters, we can ask one by one which parameter is most effective at driving this percept, in particular, say, over that percept, or what is the logic and syntax of the code that drive these distant, different sensory perceptions. And so that is certainly where we are right now. And um, these are the funding sources. And I thank you for listening. So, hey, tremendously cool. I think it's really neat that you've got this working. The other thing I can imagine you can do with this, so it's always challenging for those of us who do a lot of electrophysiology to sort of know exactly what calcium signals mean and how reliable they are. And obviously, two photon is much more reliable than one photon. But you have a data set now and a technique that potentially means that you can really, at least for this system, evaluate that rigorously. So what, do you, you know, what are you seeing in this particular system for calcium signals in terms of? You're asking about the calibration of the GCAM. Yeah, for example, like how often does a single spike not give you something oh. that you can identify? Um, how, I would how say how rarely in our wake behaving mice is a single spike easily detectable. So maybe other people are way better. But you know, clearly two or three spikes are, are quite detectable. But you're saying, have we done a systematic characterization? Well, I would still probably put an electrode on one of these cells and do that exact experiment. We're also putting multi-electrode arrays in and doing that experiment to ask, is your mountain sort very good? Yeah. <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. But that's, that's good because you can, I mean, first of all, you can't necessarily always, every time you stimulate, you're going to spike one cell and you're going to bias strongly that cell. Maybe another cell will spike occasionally if it happens to be highly depolarized and get a little bit of light. So there's some issues, but yeah. Um, just following up, uh, a very brief question on the gamma issue. It sounds to me like you're um, as interested in uh, defining gamma uh, functionally as in terms of just frequency. Um, so, um, Walter Freeman believed that gamma was actually the result of feedback from inhibitory neurons. So I wonder would you be sympathetic to that? Yes. Okay. I mean, that's it, literally what I. Uh, so, somatostatin cells are feedback into neurons. Okay, cool. We're, so we're, absolutely, we're, that yeah. hypothesis I believe is true. And on the second part of your talk, um, let's say um, that we could establish that uh, neurons could do a pseudo Fourier transform. Would that satisfy you? Uh, in what context? 
Um, as the neural code of perception. Sure, I guess that's satisfying, yeah. Okay, I, 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 think, I think we have done so. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, I've been trying, I mean, it seems it's awesome to stimulate the cell. Can you speak like, up? Um, so it's, it's really cool to stimulate the cell, but I'm wondering if just like, can, can the mouse just tell the difference between one random population and a different, could you just like train the mouse to detect the stimulus? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident you could do that. So BMI a little bit works like that. It's been done with calcium and dense cell move lab, Jose Carmen lab. But yeah, uh, we haven't tried it. It's an interesting question. And you can ask, can they tell the difference between two very similar spike trains with one spike jittered? I mean, you could play all these games. Is that informative? It may be a philosophical discussion. We're trying to ask what features of the natural stimulus would best correlate with perception that is in a mouse doing a task. But yeah, you could definitely do that. And I think it would work. Because you're going to drive down activity downstream, right? The activity we're generating of these 20 or 50 or a few hundred cells in layer 2, 3 has to propagate, which I'm sure it does, down to layer 5 and other cortical areas. Well, like maybe. I mean, may, or maybe it's just like nonsense and it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like, noise. Alternative so, hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. You showed very nicely that when you did the sequential activation, you basically get one to one um, input output function. Do you see the same fidelity when you do the combinatorial stimulation? Uh, when you say fidelity, you mean spatial resolution, or what do you mean? No. One light pulse gives you one spike. Oh. We, so we did do that. Yep. I see. Well, you're worried about, like, network stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So under anesthesia, when we did it, where there's not a lot, it works fine. So what we did is we patched one cell, and we stimulated, like, 30 cells, and we just see how that one cell responded. And then it does respond very precisely. But of course, as you recruit many cells, particularly in an active network, you're getting inhibition. If you look at this movie, by the way. I'm not worried. I'm curious. No, no, I'm not worried either. But <laughs> what's cool, I mean, this was certainly a good reviewer question for us, is, is that there are definitely cells that respond that are not being driven. They're actually 50 to 100 microns away from any hologram. But, you know, cortex highly recurrently connected. Um, these are all excitatory cells. We know that here, because genetically. But if I bet if you're measuring somatostatin cells, they'd be firing like mad. Which, you know, when I was in Mossimo's lab, we would stimulate these cells with one photon, and the first thing to trigger was a somatostatin cell. Probably, here we can actually ask how many cells are needed to drive. I mean, Mossimo actually did a patch clamp, but you can ask, you can actually parameterize the whole thing, like how many cells are needed to drive a certain type of cell or something like that, or how many spikes in a certain time window. Yeah, I mean, this is probably going to be a not very informative question. I'm, I'm just curious what you think, right? So uh, I really like the approach. The issue is that there are very few trials, right? So let's imagine you could get 500 trials out of a mouse a day. You probably only want to stimulate on, say, 20% of them. That leaves you with 100 trials. Uh -huh. You want to detect a behavioral effect in a mouse that's doing, like, 70%. Right. right so so I'm, I'm curious if in this way of parametrically changing mm -hmm. patterns of activity, yeah. Um, I, I'm just curious to hear your yeah. thoughts on where to start. So how do you get enough trials? We might have so few trials that you, you, you literally sort of going th after the space I mean, will only be possible in many days. So I'm just curious to, uh, to hear what you think. You're 100% correct. I mean, you can't get enough statistical power on many different combinations in one mouse in one day. You have to average over many mice in many days. You, look, you can do this for months in the same animal. So at least if you can collate across days in one animal, you can get thousands and thousands of trials on a single mouse. And then you have enough postdocs. They can do thousands of mice. Okay, but you're right. There, there's, a there's a problem that you can't get all this data in a single session in a single mouse. And you're right. Only 20% or 30% of the trials will be take out the physical stimulus and put in the, the optogenetic stimulus. Otherwise, a lot of things bad happen if you keep just stimulating the brain. It's not okay. Uh, have you guys quantified how much cells are depolarized by the imaging laser? Yep. Don't have the slide for you, but the key thing here, uh, you're talking about the optical crosstalk, is that this opsin chrome has some absorbance at the 920 line. And it, it, so it can get severe if your opsin is very slow, but because our opsin is super fast, as the laser flies across, the dwell time is very low, and you get a blip of about a millivolt, provided your imaging alert volume. If you zoom in onto one cell, it's like a spiral scan, you'll fire the cell. But so far, the actual modification by the, tr the crosstalk is, is pretty low. I wish it was better, but it's, it's probably negligible compared to the background activity in these cells, which is mass dwarfs that. So you don't see changes in spontaneous? No, not really. Again, if you zoom in, you do. 
Maybe we should thank Helen and take it down to the hills.